morning. Please open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yes, that means he's doing that series again. <laughs> have some visitors with us this morning. We're glad that you're here. Glad to see all of you here, whether you're supposed to be here or a visitor. As we continue in this series of all things new, we've considered our relationship with God. And that new relationship with God. He's not just our God. As disciples, He's our Father. That newness and closeness of, of a relationship. The whole point in this series is, guys, don't, don't rush past this. Don't rush past it into something else. He's our Father. And just a hint... Our reading plan for next year is not going to be a let's get through the whole Bible in one year. We're going to read the New Testament chapter by chapter next year to allow us, those of us who read, not to rush, but to sit on it and kind of stew in it and marinate in the words of God. We studied recently that we've come to understand that even a new relationship with the world, when Jesus came as Lord and Messiah, He came loving and serving the world. He had a ministry to the world. Not because the world was an enemy, even though it was, but it was because He loved them. Strangers, even enemies, serving them. And that's a big change because of the gospel, because that's not a normal default setting for folks. Sometimes when you study the scriptures, you can pull out things about the enemy, and, and there, we, we can create a barrier and a hedge between us and the world. There is a difference. We are supposed to come out from among them. We're supposed to be separate in our character, separate in the way that we live, separate in what we believe, but not separate from them that we have no relationship with them, because we want them to be saved. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us with this message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making His appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin. So that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. You'll notice you have pronouns in your version. For our sake, He, God, made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin. That in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. seems all God has ever wanted to do. As we've read the Bible from, from Genesis and, and as we're now into the New Testament, all God has ever wanted to do was to bless us. And sadly, humanity has never really been enthralled with His blessings. We weren't delighted with His presence in the garden. Sinai was impressive, but that impression didn't last. Jesus came and even His own who should have known Him better rejected Him. And as disciples now in our day and in our time, we can become numb and in a rut in our discipleship. New, He said. All things have become new. Almost as if, you, you remember in Acts where Paul said, everybody in Athens, all they wanted to do was hear something new? Here you go. Something different, something new. But I fear between me and you sometimes, the new wears off. And the joy wears off. In John 17 and verse 3, a passage that we've read repeatedly, and you could probably say it with me, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, 
the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. From the beginning of the spread of the good news about Jesus, this, this part of the series is a new relationship with one another. Please turn with me to Acts chapter 2. There is a one anotherness to our discipleship. We have a new relationship with God as the Father. We have a new relationship with those who are not Christians because we are servants to them. We, have, we, have, we are given this ministry of reconciliation to be a servant to the world. And I save this one for last because I'm just going to be honest with you. And tra- well, not honest with you. I always try to be honest. Transparent with you. This one was the toughest one for me to put together in one lesson. I'm not going to try to be, be appalled to your Eutychus this morning and to be too long in it. But if you look at the one another passages in the New Testament, if you do like a concordance search like that, I think you'll be surprised at how often one another is mentioned. Starting at the end of Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 36, and it says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. And with many other words He bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received His words were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and with generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And the literalist said, Mark, one another's not in that passage of Scripture. No, literally one another is not in that passage of Scripture. It's all over that passage of Scripture. These first disciples, when they heard the gospel call, they said, what are we going to do? And it changed them. It changed who their one another's were. So what did they do with one another? Well, if you read 42 to 47 again, they did a lot of stuff with one another. And that goes against the idea that we might kind of fall into the rut with in our life. I'll go to church, but then I'm going to live my life. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. No, we're not going to do all of the one another passages of Scripture this morning. I only have about 16 more. Just kidding. Uh, Some of you are awake. That's good. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offsprings, heirs according to the promise. When my mom died, there were two heirs, my sister and myself. And we were equal. She said, you share everything equally. Well, unfortunately, she was the exec... She she loves to say this word, the executrix (laughs) of the estate. That's what mom did with my grandfather's estate. She, She liked that tricks that feminine ending on there. She she liked that. She executed the estate and everything was, and she, I mean, to pennies, she would do this work of making, and it was just like, Annette, come on. No, 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 we're equal. Well, you see, you see what equal means? 
You see what one another means? You see what family means? Well, Mark, of course, that's your brother and sister. Well, what does he say here about us? He says there's no hierarchy in the kingdom. There's God, and then there's us. Well, I don't what about... I mean, don't, don't always what about everything in Scripture. What does he say here? He says you are one together in Christ. As many of you as were baptized into Christ... Doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek, or you're slave or free, a Sith or barbarian, male or female, all of you are one in Christ, heirs of God. There are no levels here. One. Jesus prayed that we might be one. He prayed that the apostles would be one in John 17, 11. In John 17, 21, he says, I pray that they all may be one, Father, as you are in me, and I in you, and they in us. One one another, fulfilling the promise that God made Abraham thousands of years ago. My question, folks, is, is this the type of relationship that we have as disciples? Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. In the ESV, there's, a, there's an italics next to the word brothers in verse 1. Sometimes in the old King James, it had the word brethren. And I would be, I would be the punky kid in my youth and say it, brethren and sistren. But that sounded too much like never mind. And so, sometimes I will read in the ESV, I will add the liner notes, because brothers and sisters doesn't mean all the males. We live in a day and time where people are triggered sometimes about that. And I know that's probably not you, but when he says, and I appeal to you therefore brothers and sisters, when it, when it just says brothers there, the context means everybody in the church. I appeal to you therefore brothers and sisters by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members... And the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ. Now here's the kicker. And individually, members of one another. You remember what, Ab what, what Cain was asked after he killed Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? Do you know the American ethic? I don't mess with you, you don't mess with me. Maybe too much America has gotten into the American church. We are members of one another. One another. And that's only possible, folks. This is only possible because of the gospel. With God and from God is this relationship possible. Because look at the world. When you look out and you think how technologically advanced we are, the, the information that we have, the knowledge that we have been granted and imparted through years and years and years, how divided is this world? Even as blessed as we are in this nation, in this republic, how divided is the republic right now? This isn't a civics lesson. But this idea of one is not going to happen because we have the best form of government. The idea of one is only going to happen because of the peace that comes from God. The peace that we have with Him vertically creates peace with us individually. Turn with me to John chapter 17. As we were studying this a few weeks ago in the men's Bible class, it's been said 
and it will continue to be said, but we need to say it again. John says that the night before Jesus was crucified, he thought about you and me. And he offered this prayer when he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they all may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfectly, completely one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you loved me. I read passages like that and I go, man, this world is terrible. Christians aren't united. What are we going to do? You know what we're going to do? A wise man once told my wife when she was having struggles at school, she says, you change your corner of the world. You know how much impact you're going to have on Christians in Uganda and their divisions? You know how much impact you can have on Christians here? You can't impact beyond your sphere of influence. Brothers and sisters, our sphere of influence is not Washington State. It's not Nashville, Tennessee, for those of us that don't live in that region. It's not, it's not even Portage, Indiana. It's right here. And as he is praying about us and thinking about us, this peace, this one another relationship has to flow from us. Not separate from us. Where the young marrieds only stay with the young marrieds and the old folks only go to Viking Chili Bowl and, and there's never any intermingling between each other. There has to be a oneness in us. Because if not, are we, are we disciples of Christ? He says that they may be one. Now, we read Romans 12. Does each have the same function? No. The passage of 1 Corinthians 12 and other places talk about there are differing functions. Ephesians 4 talks about the differing functions and giftedness of people in the, in the, the church. But he said one. Look with me back a couple of chapters in John chapter 13. Now what some may be prone to do after this lesson is we may start evaluating others who aren't one. Don't do that. Don't do that today. Don't leave today evaluating all the folks that you know aren't being one. Be one. And love. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Have you all ever thought how awkward this is in English? This, this is just an awkward flow in the statement. But don't miss the point in the awkwardness. Love each other. Am I responsible for other people? No, I'm not responsible, but I am accountable to them. I have a response. I have an accountability to love you. Like family. Like Jesus did. Verse 35. He gave the litmus test to the unbelievers. He says, by this all will know that you are mine if you have this love for one another. Disciples of Christ enjoy a unique relationship not really duplicated in the world. Everybody's looking for it. They look for it in sports. There's 105,000 screaming orange-clad rednecks last night in Knoxville, Tennessee who were one of one mind when they beat down my beautiful blue Kentucky Wildcats. And they look, for, they look for one, and then they all go home. And then it doesn't last because next week, the rambling, uh, big black and red going to come down the track on Georgia. And you, but you know all the black and red folks in Georgia are, are one because we... And, and, and we, it, it's almost inherent that humans search for this community. Sports and... Knitting and LARPing. And I mean, we, we look for community. Yes, I know about LARPing. If you have no idea, you're not, you're not really missing anything. And if you didn't hear what I said, I just offended some folks probably. We look for community. And what has God given us? 
He's given us one another. The ultimate sense of community that we can find. And it's because of this, this unique relationship brings together those who would otherwise be alienated. And his disciples, zealots and tax collectors, were prayed to be one with each other. This works so much that even Yankees and Southerners can be one with each other. And we can get over something that happened 170 years ago. Jews and Gentiles. In the first century church, here was part of the mystery of the gospel. That Jews and Gentiles could be one together. That in 20th and 21st century America, black and white could be one together. Masters and slaves, one. Now in a hierarchical culture like the Roman and Greek culture, masters were here, slaves were here. Once they became disciples, all things new. So that Paul wrote Philemon and says, when Onesimus comes back with this letter, he's not just your slave anymore, Hoss. He's your brother. And if you think he owes you something, how much do you owe me since I taught you the gospel? And I'm going to hit a little closer to home here. All us suburbanites think all those rural people are idiots for living in town. One. We're supposed to be one. Now, when, when does this happen outside of the gospel? Doesn't, does it? In fact, oftentimes we seek to divide along those lines. We look for it because it makes us more comfortable. We find community there. Where does God tell you to find community? Not in a homogeneous group of people. But what, what makes us homogeneous is the blood of Christ. Not our skin tone, not our academic achievements. Not where we're from, not our political beliefs, not our sports fantasies. Now, none of this is what calls us to one. What calls us to one is Jesus. And the only way that that happens is disciples of Christ. I mean, could you imagine being a Jew and walking into a church and seeing Gentiles and Jews getting along together and hugging each other and shaking each other, granted, giving each other a holy kiss? You'd be thinking, unclean, unclean. And Jesus said, remember what He said to Peter? Don't call something unclean that I've made clean. And what does he... Who does he make clean? And of such were some of you. All things new. As disciples, The bar that we're trying to get over is being one in Christ. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. This, uh, this passage of Scripture hit home with me a few years ago when I heard, I heard a man call a sister mother. I'm like, what? What? He said, read Matthew 12. I'm like, okay. So let's read Matthew 12, 46 and following. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. And he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brethren. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I only have one mom, but I have a whole lot of spiritual mothers who have mothered me and helped me, not in a state of higher than me, but have helped me. You'll find interesting, he doesn't say fathers. He said, call no one father on the earth, for one is your father in heaven. But he looked around and he said, I got a lot of moms out here. Where are you going to find that? Where are you going to find that in the world? Where you have folks who aren't your genes, folks who aren't your blood, care enough about you to help mother you. Especially if you haven't had a mom. 
When we think about the blessings of discipleship and we look at all of these blessings, friendship, companionship, belonging, help and encouragement, a path to understanding more about God, a sense of purpose, correction, comfort and joy, and the prayers of people praying to God about you. People who take enough time. You see, the interesting fact about John 17 is Jesus thought about us. And when you sit on that for a little while, that means something. This is what we're. This is this is what one another happens. This the, this is the blessing of this one another relationship. When it's really one another, when you show up for one hour during the week and go home and live your life, guess what? You're not going to get. One of the reasons that this was the toughest lesson for me was because a lot of times during our one another times, it's work for me. And you're like, well, Mark, that's what you get supported for. I haven't always approached our one another times as I should. Honestly, there are some times that I feel like a chicken with my head cut off because the bulletin this and Bible study that and whoever asked me for extra copies from the Bible study, I didn't get them done. See, there's, there goes a chicken right there because it's work. And I'm, I'm thinking about this and that and everything else and sometimes I just say hi and I glaze by and I don't want our one another times for me to be that way. And so that's why this lesson was tougher on me because while I'm at work, I don't want to be at work during our one another times. Because I want the benefit of you in my life. And I'm going to try better, to do better. But it also made me think of many folks that I observed through the years who miss out on this blessing. They miss out on being strengthened by one another. Attending worship and Bible studies are things that disciples shouldn't even consider missing. It shouldn't even, it shouldn't even cross our mind that we would want to even absent ourselves from it. I'm not going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. That's been done long enough. You know what it says. <laughs> but I'm also talking about all of our one another times too that aren't necessarily in this building. We've had potlucks through the years that some folks never come to. We have men's and women's Bible classes that sometimes that folks never come to. We have folks who will never extend hospitality to other brothers and sisters in Christ. They never go out of their way to go out to that Viking chili bowl thing with the seniors or, any, or anywhere else for that matter. And they will say, well, I was never invited. How about inviting somebody else? Because one another is a two-way street. We have folks who never join in our work group activities. They'll never attend a party or a shower or a social function. If a celebration is hosted by fellow Christians, you know the, the command, rejoice with those that rejoice. Well, we're going to absent ourselves from that because I don't have to come. That sounds like one another, doesn't it? There are those who rarely get involved with anyone else. They use this church building as a pass-through and run away from other opportunities. These beautiful blessings that God has blessed us with. This opportunity, this open floodgate of blessings and relationship. And we just say, oh, I don't have to. The Bible doesn't say, I have to do those things. I just have to come on Sunday. It's apparent from the Acts 2 passage that we read earlier that the disciples actually spent, looked to spend time together. You say, Mark, well, you don't understand how busy I am. I understand you have the same 24 hours that everybody else on the planet has and has ever always had. And you can fill your time with whatever you want, and I can fill my time with whatever I want, and we can go ourselves happily along the way straight to hell if we don't understand this relationship. Beware, brethren, 
lest we fall into a rut of what we've always done and not let the newness of the gospel impact us even after decades of being a disciple. It's also been apparent over the last few years that some have convinced themselves that staying home and watching their computer screen is equal to being at church. How do you want another when you're not? Trick question. Can't. Of course, it's not always convenient. And even like this lesson, perhaps to some, it's not even done well. Of course, there are folks in church who are going to get on your nerves. And yet, if we think our lives are better by avoiding those times and situations and dealing with less than ideal people, I would ask that you would go back to that computer screen and listen to the last two lessons on this new relationship and hear what the Holy Spirit has. It's clear the Holy Spirit in His Scriptures informs us that if we absent ourselves from this one another relationship, our lives are going to be weaker, we're going to be prone to temptation, our lives are going to be more miserable than if we had put ourselves in the relationship as we should. It'd be like blaming your spouse when you've been cold and say, well, if he'd have done something different, our relationship would be better. That's not how marriages work. Even while we were enemies, a couple of verses earlier from that passage that Mark read earlier this morning in Romans chapter 5, it says, even while we were his enemies, Christ died for the ungodly. Even if your brother or sister in this one another relationship ends up like an enemy, you know what we're supposed to do? One another him. One another her. And perhaps we'll find... There is a modern myth that happiness comes at the end of success. I actually think that's the cart before the horse. I think success comes after, comes at the end of happiness. Because we decide when we're going to be happy. It's not our experiences that make us happy. We decide to be happy in the experiences that we have so that we can say, happy are those who mourn. Happy are those who are suffering and persecuted. And what you find at the end of that is success, not happiness. We decide when we're happy. Where we are, where God has planted us, or where God moves us to. What, we decide that we can be happy even going through persecution and suffering. Please see 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 to 4, and on. Happiness doesn't come after we've checked off all the boxes, how much money we have, where we are, who we're around. Happiness comes in the Lord. And we decide to be happy in this one another relationship that He has blessed us with. We have a choice to make, y'all. We have a choice and a series of choices to make in our relationship. Is our life going to be new because of Jesus and continuing new in Christ? Are we going to walk around like Eeyore all the time? I'm not being hypocritical. I've been Eeyore. And if you don't know the tales of the Hundred Acre Wood... What have you been reading yourself and your children for crying out loud? <laughs> oh, Pooh. Maybe one of these days I'll finally be happy. Maybe those people at church won't get on my nerves again. We have a choice to make. We can do it our way or his. When it comes to be baptized, we can follow the Lord. We can be satisfied with what everybody else teaches about it. When it comes to our life choices, we can play with fire. We can accede to our own comfort. There's one place, there's one path that leads to eternal happiness, to His presence. And our Lord said, it is this one another new relationship in God, with one another, and with a view toward the world. 
And he said, choose well. Because if we choose otherwise, it leads to a time and a place away from his presence. You don't want to do that. There was a brother who preached here a long time ago, and he said that during the meeting. And he was, he was renowned for saying it during his meetings. He says, folks, if you miss heaven, you miss it all. Don't miss. But aim well. Aim well and shoot your shot. Aim well and make a path. Aim well and take the step. Aim well and do what God said to do. Then you'll be surprised. Maybe. How this newness of life can brighten your life and others around you. If you're not a disciple of Christ, heed His words. Listen to His call. And if, as the song that we're about to sing asks, do you know my Jesus? Well, if you know Him and you're not following Him, whether you were baptized, have not been baptized, or you were baptized 40 years ago, all things can be new. If you would, answer the call of the gospel today as we stand and sing.